On today's show, we talk to Academy Award-winning composer Elliot Goldenthal. We talk about his background and training, studying with legendary composers Aaron Copeland and John Corigliano, his approach to composition and style, his upcoming projects, and much, much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show. We've got an amazing guest today, Academy Award winning composer Elliot Goldenthal. He's the composer for films such as Alien 3, Interview with the Vampire, Heat, Titus, Public Enemies, Batman Forever, Demolition Man, Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within, and many more. Goldenthal's original two-act opera, Grendel, directed by Julie Taymor, premiered at the L.A. Opera and was a finalist for the 2006 Pulitzer Prize in Music. Goldenthal has composed music for more than a dozen theatrical productions, including Juan Darien, A Carnival Mass, which received five Tony nominations, including Best Musical and Original Musical Score. Goldenthal recently composed the music for the Netflix-produced film Our Souls at Night. In October 2017, the Chamber Orchestra of Philadelphia premiered a trumpet concerto written by Goldenthal. He's also composed the original music for M. Butterfly, starring Clive Owen on Broadway in the fall of 2017. Elliot, welcome to the show. Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, It's a pleasure. Well, Elliot, how did it begin for you? Do you remember what age you started music or music lessons? Yeah, I think um, music started me. I didn't start it. Uh, (laughs) I I think I I started um, hmm, about three to five years old. I realized uh, um, it was a piano in the house, and it was a way of uh, kind of disappearing into my uh, own uh, own world uh, that seemed to block out the unpleasant things around me. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, uh, it was approved by everyone else. Uh, you know, it's rare to have a, a child uh, do something uh, marked with such uh, approval uh, one, in something that uh, the child really enjoys. Were your parents musicians? Did they, you mention so there no, was a piano no, in the house? No, they were in. Uh, it was a small piano, and they were in uh, working class. My father was a house painter. My mother was a seamstress, uh, and uh, uh, there was a piano there, and uh, it was just uh, uh, they encouraged me. Uh, uh, throughout the uh, early years of my uh, musical exploration. They saw that you had talent. Do you have perfect pitch? No, thank God. Uh, (laughs) I have so many friends that do. And um, when you have perfect pitch, which is a form of memory, um, uh, every instrument, every piano you play on uh, is slightly tuned tuned differently. And... uh, Things, uh, you know, some orchestras tune one way or another way, and it's, uh, it's a, uh, sometimes it's a more of a, discra- a distraction. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, the great composers of the world, uh, it was, it's like a 50-50, um, you know, who had perfect pitch, who didn't, you know. At the age of three, four, and five, what were you doing? Were you picking out melodies? Were you composing? Were you transcribing things that you heard? Well, yeah, I was um, picking out melodies, uh, and uh, interesting phenomena uh, developed over those years uh, in uh, trying to f- sound like the music uh, I w- wanted to uh, play exactly the same. It came out wrong. And uh, in coming out wrong, uh, it was uh, actually a form of creativity because uh, that's the way I I heard it, not exactly that way it was. So um, it um, it uh, in playing stuff wrong, 
uh, it sounded quite original. Were those compositions, were you also coming up with melodies? Yes, later on, uh, uh, when I say later on, I, I, uh, towards 9 and 10, 11 years old, I, I started to compose my old, uh, own uh, melodies and uh, little suites of music that uh, lasted uh, 4 to 10 minutes and things like that. Uh, but um, uh, as I... I moved on in age, uh, you know, early te- early teens. I realized that I had a um, uh, I had an enjoyment uh, of uh, writing things in longer forms. Uh, some people um, relish and enjoy and are really really uh, brilliant uh, at writing songs, so- short songs. I, I uh, gravitated towards. Uh, Longer, longer forms, so like small motives, uh, stretched out over, developed over um, uh, many minutes, like ten, thirteen, fourteen minutes of of, of time. So, I, I enjoyed that uh, way of music story, storytelling. Did your parents uh, get you a piano teacher when they saw that you had some aptitude? Uh, they did, and um, uh, I. My brain was going faster than uh, the lessons, so um, I was a horrible student. Uh, you know, uh, it, it wasn't um, it wasn't suited um, for me. I, I had to um, really slow down, and uh, uh, when I actually went into a serious uh, 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 musical study and conservatory, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, I. I um I had to pull myself back and and say you know and and uh, accept the uh, rudiments and uh, step by step approach as opposed to uh, you know speeding uh, right ahead you know. You've mentioned in in other places that is it true that you are dyslexic and if so how did that affect your learning? Well, thank do- uh, dog I am, thank dog. But uh, anyway, um, yes, it 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 does um, um, in a way that um, inversely, when I uh, my ideas come fast, in terms of uh, writing things down and getting uh, everything correct, I, I tend to uh, make a lot of mistakes, and I have to be very very slow and careful. Uh, about that process. In the same way, it's a uh, blessing in disguise because uh, uh, I, I, I really inspect and uh, uh, um, uh, I'm very careful about what uh, finally goes down in the, in, in the, um, the later stages of uh, refining. Could you paint a picture of your childhood uh, before your teens? How much time were you spending with music, and were you also doing other things that a kid does, like play sports and that kind of thing? Well, the, the, um, sports was the most important thing to me. Um, I enjoyed um, uh, uh, in New York, uh, baseball was a big sport, and uh, I couldn't imagine uh, not being a professional you know, uh, you know, playing second base for the New York Yankees. I couldn't <laughs> imagine that. Uh, and and uh, so, so every day uh, uh, from, especially in the summer months when the school was out, uh, I just, you know, from dawn to dusk, uh, I remember playing uh, baseball and uh, and uh, sports. And, and uh, music it was something that I had... Um, uh, and more of a uh, more of a private um, uh, um, uh, aspect to my personality, but uh, I was just uh, I suppose I was just like uh, most children around, uh, but uh, I had that other world of uh, listening, especially listening, you know, to uh, the greats and. Uh, you know, uh, classical music and, and jazz and world music. And uh, I used to, you know, I remember closing my door to my room and 
being private and listening to uh, the greats of music, and uh, I could be in there for hours and hours and just listening and listening. And so did you have an extensive record collection? Uh, yeah, but I, I was very, very, uh, um, uh, very sloppy about um, in that in those days it was, uh, you know, um, actually uh, 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 vinyl records, and uh, it was... Uh, it, they scratched very easily, so uh, I used to um, uh, listen to so much stuff. I, I never put the records back in their sleeves, and they got scratched up very, very, very fast. So I got, got used to listening to music with, uh, you know, hiss and scratches and all sorts of gnarly things. <laughs> and were you a big practicer as a kid? Did you you mentioned you? You didn't take to the lessons uh, like like a concert pianist, but what did you do to practice, and what was practice in your way? Well, later on, um, when I was like 14 years old, I, I took up playing the trumpet, and uh, th that was uh, a very important thing in my uh, young uh, middle ages, uh, the uh, uh, 14 to 18 period of life, because... It exposed it, uh, exposed me of playing in um, uh, school orchestras, community orchestras, uh, uh, and uh, bands, and uh, it, it created a more of a, a social situation uh, where uh, a community situation where I, I played in orchestras, and uh, my reading uh, improved um, tremendously, and. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, sort of the um, sort of refreshment of my uh, muscles, uh, uh, brain muscles and lip muscles, and and uh, playing a trumpet every day, going over the same things, uh, uh, the same exercises over and over again, uh, a number of hours. Uh, I, I enjoyed that uh, ritual a lot uh, more than I did on the piano. Maybe it was because, uh, um, it, uh, by extension, uh, um, playing the trumpet uh, uh, brought me into um, community and social situations where I interacted with uh, my friends, etc. Uh, and uh, uh, and that that was extremely important. Also, it. Um, it made me focus on uh in on um the com mechanics uh being in the uh, engine room so to speak of uh of composers um, you know by listening to every section the flute section the cello section uh, you know how composers put together things to create an orchestral work Ah, and you mentioned, so by that time, you were writing those longer pieces, as you mentioned earlier. Um, how did that right. coincide with your band practice and your working? Uh, did, did you show your pieces to your music teacher? Well, I'm, I was very lucky, um, and I, I grew up in a time in New York where they had a, a very, very healthy, a liberal education uh, um, a focus. And I, I had a, a high school called John Dewey High School uh, that um, was uh, eight hours a day uh, of um, class um, but you have a you had a, gr a great la um, latitude you had a, a, a ability to pick your hours what your uh, focus was on so I, I was able to uh, uh, as long as you pass the uh, statewide academic tests so um, I, I concentrated on music nearly five, six hours a day, every day, and uh, and uh, it was um, it was a tremendous, tremendous uh, 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 opportunity to have lived through the, through that time when the uh, public and uh, um, uh, all the uh, uh, <clears throat> all the it was a perfect storm uh, of of. Uh, political luck uh, in, in terms of the government that I was able to uh, have such a, a rich uh, uh, education uh, in public schools, you know. Now, did you know at what age that music would be your professional career? 
Yeah, the day I found out that I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and what age was that? Oh, but it must have been around uh, 18, 19, okay. yeah. So, uh, and what did your parents say? Did they, because did they, they they're not musicians themselves, did they ask you, um, so what, how would you make money and what was the, what, what will be your bread and butter trade and how will you make money through music? How did you answer them? Well, there was, they realized that uh, at least, at least I could teach. So, so um, yeah, at least I would make, the uh, kind of money uh, plus than they were making, and um, and and they figured that in the least I, I would uh, uh, enjoy my life, be happy, and uh, not uh, be um, uh, and, and and as well as uh, a little more uh, intimate, independent. Uh, uh, I think. Um, uh, they never imagined uh, oh, the kind of um, uh, uh, living you can make, and uh, as um, writing for a film, for example. Uh, but anything less, anything less. Uh, um, you know, teaching uh, teaching music, uh, whether private uh, or uh, in, in a academic situation. Or, or uh, playing in an orchestra, something. Um, all those possibilities were uh, a, is a decent living, and uh, they they um, th they applauded that. They encouraged that, I should say. How do they react to your first ballet variations on early glimpses at the glimpses, age of, yeah, on uh, the age of fourteen? I, I think, Not many people yeah, write uh, ballets at fourteen. Yeah, uh, I think. Um, I was very lucky. Also, that that came about when I was in that same high school, and the uh, the dance department and uh, uh, and uh, myself uh, collaborated on that piece. Uh, so it was actually staged, um, and uh, it was performed in uh, you know. Um, uh, at the high school auditorium, about you know, 200 seats or 500 seats. I, I don't remember, but I, I um, uh, but it was a very, very important, um, uh, important um, uh, significance to me because um, I had to get as a pianist. And along with um, choreography, so I had to play, uh, play it exactly the same way at every performance. It was no um, fudging it, you know. So it, it, it became set. It became set as a composition, and I, um, it was um, written out in my own hand uh, very, very carefully. Uh, to be uh, played by other people. Now, in college, you went to the Manhattan School of Music, and you've yes. had two very famous composers as your teachers, Aaron Copeland and John Corigliano. Which teacher did you have first? No, no, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, John Corigliano was my principal teacher. He, he, st uh, he, he was my teacher in the university, in the conservatory, for seven years. And, uh, and as a, uh, just a, a stroke of luck, I found myself working uh, uh, helping uh, um, Aaron Copeland in his uh, summer uh, in, 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 uh, during summer uh, vacation when uh, I, I worked in uh, as a, uh, a personal assistant of, of Aaron's and uh, you know making his breakfast, doing his laundry uh, things like that but in between times I had a good fortune of playing through his scores with him um, in, in a very very slow uh, fashion, but um, I, I had the opportunity of being with him, uh, you know, twelve fourteen hours a day, and in the, in that time he was very generous in uh, spending time um, serving as a kind of a teacher, going over my scores, giving me. Um, uh, 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 tips on what I should do, what I should not do, and along with that, he he told me stories about his life and uh, 
it was very relaxed when you spend, uh, you know, 14 hours a day with a person, uh, you know, uh, for months and months and months. It turns out to be, you know, uh, year after year after year. Uh, uh, it, it becomes um, something more of a family mom- member and, and a teacher put uh, all in one. But um, in terms of academic uh, 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 strict uh, 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 teaching, uh, John Corleone was my principal uh, teacher. To talk about Aaron Copeland, uh, he must have been in his seventies, right, when he when you started working with him. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, it's very easy to remember because he was born in uh, nineteen hundred. Right. <laughs> yeah, and that must have been quite a thrill. Did you know his work before you started hanging out with him? No doubt. No doubt. Uh, I, I knew his work. Um, and uh, as well as um, John Corleano, myself, and Aaron Copeland lived within uh, uh, a, a three mile radius. Uh, that he grew up in the early, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20th century. Uh, the beginning of the 20th century, John uh, at the uh, middle of the 20th century, and myself on, at the end of the 20th, 20th century, all within a, um, a you know a three to five mile radius in Brooklyn, New York. You used to play a lot of forehand piano with him. You mentioned playing his works. What did you guys talk about regarding music? I'm very curious what interesting things he said to you personally. And what did he think of your compositions? Well, the second question first. Uh, and I, I was writing a, a, a piece for brass. I remember uh, that um, uh, was uh, my first published published piece uh, called a brass quintet number no. two. And uh, he looked at it, and um, and uh, he he was uh, car- encouraging me to simplify things uh, at the time. And um, I don't remember. I remember uh, when I finally um, they when it finally went to the publisher. Uh, I was very happy until I saw the proofs, uh, and it, the proofs were, were full of mistakes, and it was too late to change. And I went to uh, Aaron and say, "Surely you can uh, call up Shermer's uh, Publishing and tell them uh, they sh- should change it at this late date." And he looked at me and said, "That'll learn you, son. That'll learn you." <laughs> <laughs> so that's one anecdote of uh, you better be careful when you try to put things in, uh, you know. Uh, uh, as things that are meant to live after you. And he liked your music. He did. He enjoy you playing things for him. Yes, uh, he. No, of course, uh, uh, not m- me personally. But um, when I was there uh, with him, uh, uh, he always uh, loved to sit down at the piano and uh, reminisce and play through his compositions. And uh, the great thing is. I wasn't the greatest sight reader of all, all times, and by that time in his uh, life, he was trying to slow down. He was uh, tr- slowing down, so his slowing down and being slow to begin with, we were perfect. <laughs> 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 now, moving on to John Corigliano, he's you said he was your main teacher. Yes, and still is in a way, yeah. You're studying with him for ev- every Wednesday for seven years. That's right. When you went to him... Were you intimidated, much like Aaron Copeland? How was your feeling at the time when you first knew you were going to work with him? Well, oddly enough, um, I started with him when I was like 18, 18, 19 years old. Uh, But my brother, uh, older brother, who was nine years older than me, uh, knew him you know, nine years before, so, uh, you know, uh, even 11 years before. So when I was uh, eight, nine years old, or even younger, seven years old, I remember John Corigliano uh, being a composer in in, uh, the local high school. 
And uh, John must have been 17, 18 years old then. And I must have been, um, you know, six, seven years old. And uh, being introduced to John, and I remember my brother saying, um, Elliot, you should study with him, uh, with him someday. That's a weird story. Uh, <laughs> you know, but um, I, I, it turned out that I did, and uh, I still take his advice to this day. By that time, 18, were you very... How developed were you when you went to him? Well, it was... Uh, I, I was all over the place, uh, filled with a lot of um, um, uh, energy and uh, a lot of, um, a, you know, semi-technical ability on the piano. My um, uh, playing was uh, um, quasi-virtuoso. And uh, when I played my pieces for him, he said, uh, you know, you you play the piano well, but you'll never really good be a really good pianist. So the next time you come in, I want you to write something completely away from the piano, because his, in his mind, I was composing things only the things I can play. So if I can play it, I can compose it. Uh, and he, he, he said, N do not write things that you cannot play, you know. So I went, uh, wrote a uh, clarinet sonata completely away from the piano. And I, I, I came in like uh, a few weeks later to show him the music. And he said, uh, can you play this? And I said, no, no, no. He, he looked at it and he said, play it. And I said, but I can't play it. Um, I wrote it away from the piano. I have no idea how to play it. He said, play it. I said, I can't play it. And he almost had me crying. He said, play, play, play it. If you don't play it, you leave my uh, uh, studio immediately. So uh, uh, and I started almost to cry. And I... I, I he said, Elliot, I don't want to hear the notes. I want to hear the music. He says, I know what the notes are. I just want to hear the music. And that kind of changed my life. And I understood what it was saying. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's kind of a, the motivation behind the notes, the, 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 the life force behind, behind the notes, the... Uh, the, the the personality behind the notes, the, and and um, all the rest he can see on paper. Now you studied with him for seven years, and he's truly a wonderful contemporary composer. How did he teach you harmony? And you said you were you were, you came in with some knowledge, but did he, what reference books did he use in terms of harmony? And and uh, did mm -hmm. he use textbooks, or did he use it from his font of knowledge? No. Uh, he didn't use any text in the books. Uh, it was a purely compositional one-on-one um, -on -one, um, teaching um, from uh, him, his, his mind to my mind. But um, in the course of uh, studying at the conservatory at Manhattan School of Music, I had like nine different classes, uh, strict, uh, strict counterpoint class, uh, uh, harmony class, sight reading class, sight singing class, chorus class, music history class, uh, 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 um, forum and analysis class, and all of those things you get in textbooks and things you have to uh, learn uh, um, uh, rigidly. Uh, but my personal compositions uh, teaching also I had another class called orchestration class, and uh, and uh, and uh, I had to uh, play before a jury in two different instruments. Uh, I had to perform to play, pass each each semester playing a jury piece at the piano, a uh, jury piece at the p a trumpet. I had to uh, 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 
sing before a jury, uh, sightseeing in different clefts, in different uh, key signatures. Uh, I had a uh, um, uh, uh, transcription class where they play a piece of music in an auditorium, and I had to write it down and submit it, uh, you know, being away from the piano, things like that. All that stuff was different than uh, the, the compositional um, composition class, which I had completely privately with uh, John Corigliano through the school in his house in his apartment. From what I've read of other famous composers like Roger Sessions and David Diamond, they were very much into making sure that your craft and your foundation was very strong. How was it like with John Corigliano? Well, he assumed that the craft came from my other studies, you know. He, um, he, he made, sh- uh, the, the conservatory made sure you had a uh, uh, a strong, strong uh, uh, study and technique. Um, but when you walked into uh, John's uh, 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 presence, he um, he was mainly into um, honesty about what you have to um, what you have to say in music and how how architecture how important architecture is in composition, the form and the architecture of it, uh, not uh, uh, through tiny little examples, but the in the course of a 20-minute piece, a 10-minute piece, how the little ideas um, uh, follow through and reveal themselves in, in, uh, in, in development uh, and... Uh, and always think about revealing things in an obvious way so people can, uh, uh, you know, understand it. Even if it's dissonant or not, uh, tonal, dissonant didn't m- mean anything to him, but the architecture had to have a, a clarity to it. Of course, people know John Corleano for his... Academy Award for the Best Original Music Score for Red Violin, his Pulitzer Prize for Symphony No. 2. Were you familiar with the, the music community of the time? And who are some of the famous musicians? Because, of course, the Manhattan School of Music has many famous alumni. Did you uh, meet other great musicians as well? Yes, obviously through um, uh, Aaron, Aaron Copeland. Uh, I uh, enjoyed a, uh, a friendship with uh, uh, Leonard Bernstein. So, um, um, you know, uh, Aaron and uh, uh, Leonard uh, was very, very close uh, throughout his entire life. Uh, And uh, John Crigliano, uh, parenthetically, he, uh, John was, uh, when John was just like 19, 20 years old, he wrote the text, he wrote the scripts, for the young people concerts of uh, Leonard Bernstein. So, so the the tradition, the line uh, between uh, 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 John and myself, and uh, John Cruciano, myself, and Aaron Copeland, and Leonard Bernstein was very, very, very connected. And uh, it wasn't obvious to me, but when you see it uh, through through a distance. Uh, from a distance, it, it 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 it's very very close. And one one thing that one thing that uh, freaks me out now <laughs> to use a, a common phrase <laughs> is that uh, uh, Aaron Copeland was uh, much older than me, and uh, he remembers uh, when he was uh, g- going to Paris uh, in uh, eighteen or nineteen again. Uh, he he shook the hand of Sanson, uh, and uh, he remembers, obviously, Stravinsky and all those people, but Sanson in particular, who shook the hand of Liszt, who shook the hand of Beethoven, who shook the <laughs> hand of Mozart. So, And I realized, in a way, I'm only four, 
four hand shapes uh, away from uh, a Beethoven. Right. <laughs> and that really freaks me out. Because uh, you think of uh, a Beethoven as being some, you know, a biblical character, yeah. <laughs> you know? But all of a sudden, and I'm only four hand shakes, five hand shakes away from Mozart and Beethoven. So, so uh, uh, you know, whenever you think of yourself, oneself, as being special, uh, you know, yeah, you're not so special, young man. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so so um, it it it, ter- it teaches you to not to have a uh, a too big a ego when you uh, consider that. It's an amazing. It's interesting you say that because of all the major blockbuster films you've worked on. Would you say that once you worked with these major figures, John Corriano, Aaron Copeland, did you feel like you could really tackle any project moving forward? Mm, from the outside, yes. From the end, uh, in the inside, when you when you get down to doing any project, you you have a you have this uneasy feeling of uh, oh no, uh, I can't possibly make it for this project. You know, everything seems difficult, and everything is c- completely different. You know, and uh, and every project has uh, has its own uh, built-in pitfalls and uh, and, uh, uh, and sand traps and things like that. You've said you've said this before. You've said I don't trust inspiration. It's important to rely on technique and honesty. And you've also humorously said you're a nine-to-five guy. But it's 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. rather than the other way around. That's right. It's still that way. Uh, in other words, uh, in New York, I'm on Singapore time. Right. <laughs> You're actually on Singapore time. Uh, have you actually been to Asia and Singapore? I've been to uh, India, uh, and uh, the um, one of the um, one of my partners, an uh, engineer, a woman that uh, I work with uh, quite. Quite often, my projects, uh, Angie Teo, she's from Singapore. You should come. You should come. I'll, we'll give you a tour here. If you like uh, Asian food and, and actually we have well, some... No, I, I certainly do. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, I went to uh, the, my, my uh, local uh, farmer's market just uh, before our call, and I picked up like uh, 18, 19 <laughs> different uh, chilies. Oh, that's great. Chilies and... Uh, <laughs> cilantro and be- be- garlic and beautiful things to cook and uh, fresh ginger uh, not uh, uh dried ginger uh for so i have my uh, knife skills to look forward to tonight you have a colleague robert l high and let me just uh yes. mention what you've said you said he and i have been working together going through the scores of strauss Mahler, stravinsky penderecki picking out every possible idea and analyzing it so would you say you're very well acquainted with the literature, the classic literature, and even film scores? Well, again, um, those composers that I mentioned, uh, among others, is uh, I, I used to listen to quite often and marveled, marveled at their orchestration. And um, Sometimes when I do a project there, when the orchestration is too much for me to, to do on my own, I work with uh, uh, Robert L. High, who is a brilliant orchestrator. And uh, and we have uh, uh, great fun of uh, opening up the scores of, um, uh, you know, Stravinsky, et cetera, and Mahler, uh, Wagner, and look how he uh, solved certain uh, 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 orchestrational, uh, 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 you know, puzzles and difficulties, and uh, and uh, we. we um, it, it, all I can say, it's great fun, because uh, you know all these. Uh, if you want to have fun with the dead. That's the way to do it. <laughs> now, Elliot, is there still stuff for you to learn? Or, I mean, I, it's very difficult for someone to imagine not, as somebody as knowledgeable as you, but are you still learning even to this day? Oh, absolutely. You know, I feel like one sand on, on a large, large desert or a large beach. You know, I, I accumulated maybe one grain of sand of knowledge. All the rest is vast in front of me. 
And so let's go back a little bit to that that schedule of that New York schedule of of working through the night. You you've said tight deadlines stoke creativity, especially when I'm in the subway and I see my name on a movie poster and I haven't written a note. <laughs> That's more of a, <laughs> a fear of being a motivator. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh you know uh, time is um it's good to have uh gestation time and it's good to have uh a time to uh slowly uh, uh, slowly um, call the elements that you wanted to you want to work with and be influenced by various things but sometimes you have flatly no time like uh, interview of the vampire it was um i i was replacing another composer at the time and uh there was no time i only had like three weeks to write two hours of music so it was um I called on my, you know, um, reservoir, reservoir of things in in me to just move forward. It was no, um, it was no reflective uh, process as opposed to reflexive process of just, uh, you know, uh, um, almost a, a muscle memory, you know, jumping like a frog or something. You've mentioned that it's it's really like using different muscles. Before your uh, your film career, you did quite a bit of theater. I still do. I, I still do. I, I, I regard my life in three different, definitely three um, uh, um, related situations uh, of, of concert, personal concert music uh, that people like to call classical music because classical orchestras are involved. Um, one is that. One is theater that includes ballet, includes uh, opera, includes the, the incidental music, incidental music for stage, and uh, the third is uh, cinema and uh, commercial movies. Uh, cinema being being more independent, maybe uh, artistically in, uh, uh, bent, and uh, the uh, movies, uh, you know, commercial movies. Like the uh, Batman movies, etc. They, they they all work hand in hand. All these things. You mentioned that being in New York and Brooklyn is really a wealth of sounds and and hearing so many different things. Uh, I've touched a lot about your classical listening, but you've mentioned listening to Jimi Hendrix, John Coltrane, Miles Davis as well, and uh, all sorts of different styles. Oh, well, I, was, uh, I was lucky enough to grow up in those peri- uh, that period to hear those people live. And it was, uh, you know, no, no more than, uh, you know, taking the subway uh, to, to hear those uh, musicians uh, in New York City at the time. And uh, I was lucky enough to attend that uh, giant Woodstock, you know, music festival, uh, uh, you know, in 1960. And you mentioned you used to play in, in rock bands, too, in the 70s. And what instrument were you playing? Were Absolutely. you a keyboardist? Keyboard and, and, and singing and trumpet. It's, it's interesting that you straddled both worlds, and that, that must have helped a lot when you were working in more contemporary styles. I, uh, I didn't feel like I, I was straddling anything. I, I, I felt like uh, uh, music is just music. Would you say music is a language? In many, uh, many languages, many human languages. You know, uh, Lois Armstrong uh, was uh, once asked uh, uh, whether... Uh, uh, um, uh, jazz is folk music, and he said, "I, I never heard no horses writing songs." <laughs> Did you? Um, how how connected are you with jazz in in terms of style? You can compose in in so many idioms, and people have said that uh, it's impossible to pigeonhole you because you are so good at anything, any style, and everything. Did you play jazz when you were playing trumpet? Did you play any jazz? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you know, um, uh, being a, a quote-unquote jazz musician is something that you have to live it. You have to live it; uh, otherwise, it, uh, we, it won't express itself through your instrument. You absolutely have to live it, just like uh, 
uh, um, classical music. You have to live it. Um, and uh, I was exposed to jazz, um, and I to this day, and I'm, I'm a tremendous fan. And uh, you know, uh, historically as well as uh, you know, contemporary developments in jazz. But you have to live it to say you play it. You know. You've cited Toru Takamitsu as an influence on you, and uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I met him once, and uh, in listening to his music, and, and his influence on me is uh, in terms of aspiration. Uh, he wrote music for concert stage, theater, and the cinema. And also, um, he was a great communicator when it came to uh, 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 young people and uh, 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 passing along information. Uh, but he, so he was an influence in as far as the way he led his musical life. Not so much, not so much the pitches or his music, but I, I, I quite admired, but you know, but that, you know, he, he's in the same category as uh, other musicians uh, as well. But I, I just, for my personality, that's a great life to have. I'd like to talk a little bit about your some of your personal works, especially a symphony in G-sharp minor, which you've mentioned uh, an interesting anecdote. You said you had a spinet piano when you were young and it could only play in these keys. No, it's not that. Um, it, it, uh, this, this particular A flat on the piano, I had a particular sound and I loved the way it sounded. Uh, it had a, a resonance, uh, resonance that, uh, I used to go back to when I, I enjoyed, uh, writing in the key of A flat. Uh, when I, uh, wrote the, the symphony, uh, A flat is, uh, G sharp, the same thing basically, and uh, 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 strings uh, players like to read uh, music in the sharp keys, and uh, so I basically wrote, uh, you know, that piece uh, in, in in the key uh, I was uh, so familiar with growing up, and and the other thing is, in the United States, everything, all electric wiring. And uh, light bulbs and everything, and refrigerators and air conditioners and everything else is electric. Uh, 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 sounds B flat, you know. <laughs> right. Everything right. is B flat, and um, and and when you go in and hear an orchestra, you you hear an A, no matter what you know. The oval player plays an A to tune everything up, and. Uh, and uh, you know, so an a, a G sharp uh, comes out being a very, very uh, um, fresh pitch right. for everyone, <laughs> but and and very familiar to me. Are keys key signatures important to you? We we know Mozart was very particular in choosing key signatures. Is that something very important to you when you're writing a piece? Do you fall to do you fall oh, back yeah, to certain absolutely. keys? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And in terms of orchestration, especially, you know, if uh, you realize uh, the uh, double basses uh, used to go down to uh, an E, but then now they go down to C's, and uh, you know, the violins only go down to G, and uh, violas go down to C, and cellos go down to C. So, so you you have in your mind. You know, very particular uh, dead ends in terms of uh, how low uh, um, the pitches can, or how high uh, uh, um, instruments are comfortable of playing. So, uh, where the open tones are in the uh, wind instruments and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, you have to be very careful. And uh, writing a piece, uh, when you hear a orchestral sound, which key you're, uh, um, you know, writing in, you know, not so much the personality of keys. Personality of keys uh, 
is another subject where uh, uh, for everyone at a has a different reference to it. Uh, uh, you know, F major in, in Beethoven was uh, you know v- very uh, sort of uh, outdoorsy key. You know. Um, uh, pastoral key, you know, uh, um, D major is a very pastoral key, uh, E flat and, and, you know, tend to be, oh, well, et cetera, et cetera. But in my case, uh, um, I, I think very much in terms of practicality, in terms of the ranges of instruments. When you were composing for Frida, Julie Taylor mentioned that Prior to that, when working on Titus, she had put some temp music and she wanted to be, when you were working for Frida, you were able to start from scratch. What is your opinion of temp music? Well, temp music can be a real help if you're stuck and you get an idea from another composer, etc., etc. But it also can be really, can inhibit the uh, creative uh, impulse. If you hear something by another composer, even or even yourself, and a scene works, you say, okay, I can go that way, and invariably you go that way. But if there's no temp music whatsoever, and you start from scratch, you're open to up to, you know, millions of possibilities and an endless amounts of possibilities not being influenced by a one or, or two or three choices for the same scene and let me add that uh, once a director many directors when they fall in love with a piece of temp they fall in love and it's hard to erase that and sometimes the editors uh, edit to the temp track. So if you try to be individual and creative, all of a sudden you uh, ran uh, run up to a, a roadblock of previously edited cuts to a temp track. Could you talk about the music that you composed for the Netflix-produced film Our Souls at Night? Yes, uh, that was a very, very gentle, gentle movie. Uh, Ritesh Batra is uh, the director, and uh, uh, I think he's original from uh, Mumbai, I think. Uh, And uh, he is a a very Americana story about um, uh, two uh, people in their final, you know, years of their lives uh, in their middle 70s, 80s, uh, uh, being quite alone in, in, a, in a small town and uh, finding themselves uh, falling in love and, uh, and uh, trying to maintain their privacy. And, uh, and uh, it's a very subtle low key music uh and and a movie uh and the, and the music had to be so um simple and so tuneful that it doesn't it didn't interfere with the acting or the uh or, or, or the the sense of place uh it had to be very very super gentle and uh, sometimes that's uh a real challenge, you know. And you also did the original music for M. Butterfly, starring Clive Owen on Broadway. Could you talk a little bit about working for that for that production? Well, uh, the most uh, challenging thing is uh, there was a great deal of uh, um, um, a Chinese classical opera in it. Uh, and uh, I had to compose original uh, Chinese opera uh, uh, styles, uh, so that that's very difficult because it's um, extremely classical, 
uh, in uh, in China, and it's very ancient and uh, it's uh, very particular. So uh, I had a somewhat uh, study as much as I can, but also hire musicians that could play in that style. Uh, um, a few uh, Chinese uh, musicians that uh, 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 studied in um, uh, recently in, in uh, Beijing and uh, 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 masters in percussion and uh, various uh, uh, Chinese woodwinds and flutes that helped me uh, get through this project. And also had uh, contemporary non-Chinese elements uh, that was um, uh, as a result of the just uh, the, just the drama on the play. So between the uh, 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 Chinese element, the uh, um, Puccini element that was there, it was based on Madama Butterfly, uh, uh, and the the original component based on the drama had uh, various um, elements to uh, juggle with, uh, including doing uh, uh, rearrangements of uh, uh, Puccini and uh, doing an amalgam between Puccini, China, uh, and and uh, Paris, uh, student riots in the 60s. So it had so many... Uh, uh, disparate uh, elements involved. Elliot, time is running out, so actually I have some very quick, fun questions that you that you can answer. Um, just super fun, super quick, and I'll, I'll just just rattle them off really quickly. Who are your top th- uh, three favorite trumpet players? Well, I have to say Louis Armstrong uh, in the classical arena. Um, it was a person named uh, Maurice André. Maurice André. And uh, 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 Miles Davis. Three directors that you enjoy collaborating with. This could be film, orchestra, or theater. Well, Drew Taymor is the f- the first one. Uh, I I enjoyed with uh, working with uh, Neil uh, uh, a great deal, and uh, and there's a whole bunch of uh, dead uh, directors that I wish I had a, a chance to. Uh, collaborate with, uh, but I can't do anything about it. Uh, who are your favorite classical composers? Alive or dead? Um, uh, <laughs> Maybe both. Uh, you know, <sighs> each century uh, has a different one. Uh, I classical, uh, Mozart, Bach, Mahler. I uh, Wagner, Stravinsky, uh, Penderecki, John Cogliano, uh, uh, goes on and on. Charles Hives. Which film scores do you are very special to you that you've worked on? Um, I think uh, uh, Butcher Boy was a very very small movie. Where Neil Jordan was one. Uh, Titus, which is a tremendous, uh, difficult, uh, and uh, a very, very hard-edged Shakespeare uh, that uh, Julie Damour directed. And uh, and uh, for my fans, uh, they uh, enjoy listening to Heat. And if you uh, listen to the soundtrack, it's very, very uh, interesting and challenging. If you could direct uh, people to your concert music works, mention some that uh, that are very special to you over the years that you've composed. Well, uh, this year I composed the uh, tr- trumpet concerto. I had the the complete uh, concerto written. Uh, I just uh, on a concert with uh, Penderecki in, uh, in Krakow, Poland. That was the latest and more, most fun. For me, I'm, I'm uh, very close to that piece. Fire, water, paper, uh, a large oratorio, and uh, my opera Grendel. What are your favorite film scores that you haven't composed but you admire? Um, I think um, I was listening to um, 
The answer to this question is that what, what I listened to last, basically. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Nights at Kabiria, which uh, which is Nina Rota and a Fellini movie, and uh, you know, there's so many out there. You know, um, you said those questions; these questions are going to be fun. That, that was <laughs> these are the most painful questions <laughs> there the, is. These the they worst are. questions. <laughs> <laughs> the worst question. <laughs> Save the worst for last. <laughs> do, do, do you have another word? Uh, was that? <laughs> I don't know. I, I might put an end to these. These are these are killing us. <laughs> uh, well, Elliot, listen. It's been such an honor to talk to you. Um, I want to end off uh, with a question from um, a young boy here in Singapore who submitted a question. Uh, Jean-Luc, he's, he's written a question. He wants to know, what inspires you in music? Uh, yeah. What inspires me? Um, what inspires me of, um, is um, intangible uh, essence or a thing that goes straight to everyone's heart in music, no matter where you are, and across uh, the whole uh, world. When you hear that, it goes straight to the heart. And that inspires me most. And, it, and, and you recognize it when you hear it. I mean, that's, that's the perfect question to end off with and the perfect answer. Um, Elliot, again, you have a standing offer to come to Singapore and, and uh, we'll Thank definitely you. take you around. And uh, any upcoming projects that you'd like to mention that we didn't get a chance to mention? Yes. Um, I have a movie that I'm doing with uh, Julie Taymor right now on the life of uh, Gloria Steinem that might be very interesting, for especially the uh, young ladies. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, and growing up with uh, struggles uh, of of being particularly uh, female struggles, and uh, so uh, Nikhil, uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much again, Elliot. Uh, we love your work, and uh, keep keep writing more beautiful music. And uh, we hope to talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to my interview with the great Elliot Goldenthal, master composer. I feel so privileged to talk to these great people. It's our mission to bring you the best musicians in the world. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. It'd mean a lot, and it'll help get more attention to the show. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you at the next show.